So today on this episode, we will be talking about the wokeification of the English language. But I'm sure it's not just the English language. I'm sure if you went overseas, you'd find the wokeification of pretty much any language. Because this is this has been an interesting phenomenon. I think all of us experienced it. Uh, five years ago, all of us knew what a woman was. And now all of a sudden, we don't. And the same thing goes for the way a lot of other terms are used. Sometimes they're being redefined. Sometimes they're just being manipulated. Racism, tolerance, equity, equality, rights, etc. We're going to be going over a lot of these today. And we're going to be talking about what their actual definitions are how they're being manipulated, and how you can effectively respond to it. All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. If you haven't already joined us on Volley, I hope you will go to the description in this podcast, click the link, and join us there. We've had a few really good conversations with listeners of the podcast in Volley, and it's been great to see everybody's faces and get to know a few of you. Uh, but go there, link's in the description. We look forward to talking to you there after this episode and continuing the conversation there. If you walk away from this episode learning more and understanding more about how to make the argument for what you believe, especially on this topic, I hope you will let us know in the YouTube comment section and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Well done. Oh, thank you, Nick. Good job, Hamilton. All right. As always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates. But other than that, an okay guy with me is my lovely wife, Tina, Queen of the Bees. Hello, everybody. And next to her is not Christian. Not slacker. Right. slacker. Total slacker. He's out visiting family and spending quality time with the people <laughs> he loves. Whatever. We'll just cut his pay for today. I'm <laughs> kidding. We're not going to do that. Are we going to do it? No. All right. And then, of course, we have Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. Nick, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation because over the years, building my political philosophy, learning more and reading and just having conversations, I felt the need at some point to stop using certain words because I felt like the left had hijacked that term and felt the need to go find a more specific term. Like, here's a primary example. We use the word freedom a lot, and the left has attempted to hijack that word, and so we may use the word liberty in, in you know, replacement of it. But I think we're going to learn a lot today. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, we were going we were going through this, and we were, you know, T and I were talking, Hamilton and I were talking about, like, okay, what are all the different words? And the crazy part was, like, at first we're like, maybe we'll do the top five. And the top five became and the top we 10. We just kept Top 10 them. became the top, like, 15. By the time you get to, like, 34, you're like, all right, we're probably not going to hit we all of these. We can make these. probably, like, four or five episodes on this. But but we're going to have to we're gonna have to go through some of them. And I, and I think we're, we're starting off with a good one. We're starting off with equity. So what does equity actually mean? Well, equity, definition of equity, this is according to Merriam-Webster, is justice according to natural law or right, specifically freedom from bias or favoritism. I've heard other definitions of this where they talk about, um, you know, a fair and just uh, outcome, et, et cetera. Sure. And what's interesting is I actually had a bill this last legislative session that the governor asked me to carry. And they had a, you know, department of like equity and inclusion, and he wanted to make it the department of opportunity inclusion. And I had a member of the press ask me like, what, what's your guys' hang up with equity? I said, I don't think any of us have a hang up with equity. I think we have a hang up with the way equity is being defined. And he's like, what do you mean by this? Well, equity just means a fair and just outcome. Nobody's got a problem with that. I said, but it's, how do you, how do you measure that? And lately, whenever we hear equity, it's always this idea of equality of outcomes. Like that's how you know equity has been achieved. When you go into a, when you look at a particular like socioeconomic status or whatnot, and, and they take a look at various demographics. So if they look at like the breakdown of the country's population and then they break it down by things like, you know, what's your sex or what's your sexual preference or what's your race or what, and then they look at, okay, where do you, where do you, you fall? And if they see any sort of disparity, well, that's an indication that we have inequity within the system. Okay. And we look at that and say, okay, th that's possible. That's possible. Or it could be that people just have different preferences. People choose to do different things. Um, you know, I, I, why, why would we automatically assume that the, if, if your version of where you think people should be at or what you think they should do, like if, if that doesn't correspond with the, you know, the data you have, well, then all of a sudden, clearly it's because there's some sort of inequity and that inequity is driven by some sort of injustice within society. Sure. And that's why we need massive government intervention, redistribution, and all these well, other things. What, what was the reporter's reaction to your reply? Well, it, I mean, he came back, he said, well, don't you think we should, you know, help people that are, I said, no, I, this isn't a, if, you're, if your thing is, do we want there to be fair and just outcomes? Yes. If your thing is, do we acknowledge that there are some people that are in worse circumstances than other people through no fault of their own. Yes. 
And if you're saying, do, should we should we attempt to help those people? Yes, but there's a million ways that we can do that. The problem is, is the way that equity is being uh, defined, the way it's being utilized to push policy, it doesn't do any of those things. It doesn't look at people on, on an individual level and say, okay, yeah, this person was in you know worse circumstances than this one, and so we want to be able to offer help. And what's the best way to do that? Is it through a government program? Is it through just fostering a sense of community where people see somebody in need or somebody that's really trying hard, but, you know, maybe doesn't have the same access to like resources and we want to, those are, those are important questions to have. That's an important debate to have. Um, but when it's just simply this person doesn't have as much as this person, therefore the government must intervene in order to make that more equitable. Well, you haven't achieved equity. You, you've achieved government intervention, but what happens when the equity that you were shooting for actually results in a perverse incentive process? Sure. Right? Greater because, inequity. Yeah. You, you've, you've now created a situation where somebody that was working really, really hard for something um, was now put on the same level as someone that wasn't trying at all. Right. Or somebody that was really working hard to make good decisions is now put on the same plane with somebody that was constantly you know, ruining their own chances based off of choices that they made. And that's the part where we don't make much distinction because they break everyone down into essentially like numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. This person has something, this person right. doesn't. This person has access to this without ever asking the more important question of like, okay, well, how do people get to these points? Um, was it truly through like no fault of their own, nothing they could they could control for? Or do we have situations where no, somebody made a series of really, really bad decisions and to take from someone that made good decisions and to give it to someone that made bad decisions in order to achieve social equity, you might actually be creating really, really perverse incentives that you don't want and actually achieve negative results for the very people you claim to want to help. But if you're not willing to look at things on an individual basis, if you're just going to make these, these, these broad pronouncement based off of, again, macro data, you're going to run into some real problems. And again, the reporter's looking at me like, but shouldn't we help people? Like, <laughs> yes, I want to help people, but I, I don't want to create perverse incentives where, you know, politicians picking, you know, who's going to get what. That's really problematic. Like you, you understand that most of the problems that we face within society that are a lot of the problems that are a general, a, a, um, a result of truly inequitable policies were put forward by politicians and by governments. Right, so we, we probably want to be a little bit careful before we just hand over a bunch of new power to those governments. It's interesting to me that that reporter equated the words and his definition of it to action. Yeah. And that if you didn't agree with equality or equity in his definition of it, then you weren't in favor of taking action. Well, that's and, that, and that's the perfect thing, right? And this is something we've talked about this a lot with Bastiat. It's this whole idea that if you don't want the governments to do something, then you don't want it done at all. Like, no. There's a number of ways we can address this. I don't like the way you're picking. Sure. But you've now, like you said, that's a great way to put it. You've now said, no, no, no. My policy is what will achieve equity. No, that's what you hope will right. happen. I don't think it will happen. And so for me to support your policy is actually do, to do the opposite of what I think will achieve genuine equity, which is, again, a fair and just outcome, not you know whatever it's interesting. a politician wants today. It's interesting that you you read off the Merriam-Webster's uh, dictionary version of, of that. But then uh, over here, in it's the Milken Inst Institute of Public Health, which uh, I think I found this in, oh gosh, I don't remember. But um, it's interesting, the definition that they use or the, 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 what they're discussing about equity versus equality. And it says that equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach mm -hmm. an equal outcome. And so it's interesting <laughs> because their definition is an equal outcome. Yeah. And it, they have this funny little, I wish I could show it to you all, uh, these people on ladders picking apples. Yeah. And one person has has to have a higher ladder in order to reach the apples. But what's really interesting to me is that there are also less apples on that side of the tree. Well, it's so I think they could move their ladder and get to the other side of the tree. Well, and these, it's but, like make different choices. Well, and, and the interesting part of that is that again, they they always act as if all these things are just there. We're just going to redistribute it differently, and then it'll provide a more equitable solution. And they pick things like, you know, three people looking over, trying to look over a fence to watch a game. Right. And they got a tall person standing on a box. 
They've got a um, an average height person that can barely look over, like you know, and then they have a small person that can't. And what they say is, well, this tall person doesn't need the box, and then this they need something, and then this the shorter person needs. And see now, look, isn't this all fair? They can all watch the game. Well, no, but that's. What you're None of them t- bought tickets for the game, first of all, <laughs> and uh, so I have a problem with that. No, there's another one that they have where it's it's like a height equality room or something, and you everybody has to uh, put on these special shoes that gives them extra height, and it makes everyone the same height in the room. Have you seen that? Yeah, I think you showed it to me. It is. Um, it's just the weirdest thing. It's 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 so funny to me because. The, another word, obviously, that we'll probably get to is diversity. But they absolutely hate diversity if it comes to height or opportunity or, or like, where you live or uh, the choices you make. Right. They want everyone to be a cookie cutter of everyone else. They do not want any diversity at all. Well, and, and, and again. It, In real. So the, the, the important part is whenever we talk about equity, first of all, properly define it. And then second of all, don't let somebody associate their desire for a particular outcome or, or the policy that they want to then become synonymous with the definition. It's like, no, no, no. You hope this policy will achieve equity. I disagree. That doesn't mean I don't want equity. It means we disagree on how to actually achieve it and what are the best policies for achieving it. So like you said, you got to kind of separate like what the actual word means with what their preferred policy position is. All right, Nick, I think that leads us to our second term, equality. Equality. It's a good segue. Yeah. Well, and, and this is this is an interesting too because equality is, is, I mean, just defined, it's just the quality or state of being equal with something else. And, and what's interesting is that typically – on the um, conservative or libertarian side of the house, when we talk about equality, we're generally talking about equality before the law. And and again, this goes back to this whole critique of equality of outcomes versus equality before the law versus equality of opportunities. Now, Thomas Sowell has pointed this out. He goes, it's even ridiculous to say, quote, equality of opportunities. Um, unless you mean from a, if you mean equality of opportunity, which means to say that there's no legal barrier, there's no government institution or whatnot coming in and, and, you know, using the threat of force to prevent you from doing something like there used to be within our, our codes. Right. But by the same token, I, I do not have, if, if you mean equal opportunity as I have an equal chance of doing that, I can tell you right now, I, I had, I had an equal opportunity in the sense that I could try out to pitch for the Dodgers, but there was no way I was going to actually be able to do that because I didn't possess, I didn't possess the inherent talent, um, you know, and, and to whatever degree of talent I might've had, you know, I, I did decided I didn't want to put in the work to try to develop that in order sure. to do it. Whereas like Clayton Kershaw had a combination of a, an incredible talent with an incredible work ethic. That's generally what you see in like these professional athletes, the incredible talent combined with an incredible work ethic gets them to where they, where they are. Um, so this idea that, well, okay, well now there's, there's something deficient in society if we don't have an equal opportunity to do the things that we want to do. Well, maybe in the sense that, yeah, life isn't fair, right? We, we have different uh, talents. We have different attributes. We have different circumstances from, you know, which we, we arise or, or that we're potentially born into. And th- there's something noble about somebody recognizing somebody else not having perhaps the same access to resources and saying, hey, I want to help this person because they're, they're working on the one. There, there's something noble about that. When you, but again, once you create a government that says, well, no, equality and now is not equality before the law. Equality is equality of outcomes or even equality of opportunity in the sense that in order to achieve that opportunity, I'm going to take from somebody else and give to this person over here. Well, now that's also problematic because if, if like, for instance, if somebody raises their kids to where they read to them every night, right? And, and they, you know, they're on them about their homework and they're, they're very, very responsible with respect to their parenting in order to make sure that, that, that their child is prepared to go to the next level with respect to their education or their career or whatever it is. And you've got another set of parents that do none of those things, right? Maybe, I mean, maybe they're just totally like uh, the horrible parents. We can look at that situation and say, okay, the equality of um, outcomes is probably, not necessarily, probably not going to be the same for those kids. And it's not the kid's fault. We can say the equality or access to opportunities is probably not going to be the same for those two kids. And it's neither kid's fault. Right? This is what they constantly refer to as like privilege. 
Now, if we say, hey, it would be a good idea for this kid that's working harder under difficult circumstances to be able to, to give them a shot, everyone would agree with that. The moment the government steps in and says, no, 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 it will be our job to level the playing field between these two circumstances because this child had an unfair advantage. Well, now, what, what have you just told the parents? You've just told the parents, you did everything you possibly could to try to, to be a good parent, to set your kids up for success, and now we're going to punish you. We're actually going to take away some of the benefits of you doing all of that in order to help somebody else. Okay, well, again, I would say, Jess, you haven't achieved justice in that exchange. And, and that's what we got to be really careful of. When we talk about equality, equality before the law is very important. The, the important part, too, is to look at this not just from the perspective of, like, kind of the nice signed-in idea. The question is, is how would you actually carry this out? Right. Right? If the only way that you can carry it out is by using, you know, the threat of force or coercion or, um, you know, other mechanisms, well, then you're, you're potentially creating additional problems in your desire to provide greater equality of opportunity. And so I, I think all we're kind of saying is you need to be you need to be careful. You need to understand that equality before the law is something that we can more or less guarantee. Right? We we can write the law in such a way to where you're not being unfairly discriminated against based off of your race or your your you know your sex or whatever. We we can do that. We can achieve that. We can't change reality to essentially say that you're going to be faster or you're going to be better at math or you're going to be better at you know whatever profession we can't change that and to simply look at the end result and say oh well if there's if if little Timmy wanted to do this and he couldn't do it but he tried super hard well then there must be something wrong with the system like or maybe that's just not the best job for Timmy but again, if, if you're just going to look at the outcomes after the fact and say, well, if we see disparities, that's automatically an indication of inequality. Well, I, I think that's problematic because once again, you're not taking into account individual, you know, you're not just taking, failing to take into account individual um, circumstances. You're failing to take into account individual preferences. Well, and not only that, but you also have the idea of perverse incentives that comes into play. Um, this may not be very popular, but I'll talk about it anyway, since we do that on this show. <laughs> um, we, our kids were briefly in the public schools, but the school lunch situation was an interesting one to watch with incentives because there were a couple of times where I was, I had forgotten to load up their lunch card to make sure that they had money to pay for their lunch. And whenever that happened, my kids did not get the same lunch as everyone else. They got this little like PB and J or, or, or cheese yeah. sandwich, like just the ba something super basic and super obvious and super obvious. And um, there were kids in the line teasing him about and not getting to have the same lunch as everybody else. And and it was so frustrating to me because we paid full price for lunch. And 70% of these families didn't pay a dime for lunch and their kids were making fun of my kid. And I just, I felt like what a perverse incentive you are, uh, you are not teaching kids that actions have consequences at all. In fact, you're basically telling them not to be the parent who pays for school lunch uh, yeah. because if you accidentally uh, don't load up the card one day, Oh my gosh, your kids having some other random lunch that isn't the same one getting made fun of by other kids. And I also noticed that there were kids who did not recognize the value of the food they were getting. I saw so much unopened food, like unopened yogurts, unopened little packages of uh, little bar, fruit bars and things like that, um, unopened milk all unopened chips being dumped into the trash because they just didn't feel like it. And I thought, what a waste of food. Why are you wasting food? But they can, they can waste the food. And so to me, I look at some of this and go, this isn't an equality issue. This is, you're telling these kids that this is the way to be and, and to, to waste food and, and not to care where it comes from or who pays for it. And I, I just, there was something about it that just got under my skin. I didn't think it was right. Um, I, I, I don't know. It, it's so the whole, that whole equality thing really doesn't go both ways. I mean, a lot of times we see uh, in order to achieve equality, you've got to hold others down and hold others back. Um, 
and and you you see that in the public schools as well where you know this kid's already done with their schoolwork and the teacher's still working on everybody else and this kid could be excelling and going but they don't have the opportunity to do so um and it, it kind of reminds me there was a film that was made several years back Harrison Bergeron Oh my gosh we need to put a link it's to it Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut um, it's incredible. Uh, you see this ballerina who is, because she's excellent, because she's better than everyone else at it, they have chained her and, and made her so, made her dance in chains because that is the only way to make her equal to everyone else. So it, it was you know, a, things like that. It was like a dystopian novel by Herson Bergeron. There, there's, a, there's a group that actually did like a 30-minute um, YouTube video about it. Um, it, uh, great too like it, it's outstanding like if you want to just see kind of this thing or just the trailer like go see the trailer we should probably put the link in there Please but do. but to give you an idea of kind of like the opening of that book it says nobody was smarter than anybody else nobody was better looking than anybody else nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else all this equality was due to the 211th 212th and 213th amendments to the constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of the agents of the united states handicapper general so basically wow. what it was is that if you had any sort of ability that allowed you to excel in a particular field, they did something to prevent you from being able to fully execute that in order to bring everybody down to a kind of this basic level of equality. And, and again, part of the part of the notion here is is explaining how equality on a, on a large sense, like across the board, if you take it to its logical conclusion and you say that, okay, equality is the, the social good. Um, well then what that means is you got to have a quality of outcomes, which means the only way you can do that, like I can't become a better baseball player. The government can't make me a, a, a Clayton Kershaw, but they can make Clayton Kershaw pitch like me. Sure. Right. And so it, it's, it's demonstrating that when you start looking at these as like ultimate moral goods, in, instead of understanding how it fits within a just society, Right, equality before the law fits within a just society because it allows each person to not be held back by their government. But if you want equality of outcomes, then out of necessity, it will require the government to come in to use coercion, the threat of violence, and violence itself in order to bring people down. Um, instead of necessarily, instead of what we should want, which is to lift people up and allow them to be the best they can be at the things they want to be the best at, right? Yeah. To, to the degree that that is possible. Do you remember The Incredibles? Yeah. The movie The Incredibles, <laughs> and they all had to hide that they were special. They had to yeah. hide that they had uh, superpowers. And Dash is the son, and he can run super fast, yeah. you know, just in a heartbeat, be where he needs to be. And he was never allowed to do that. And when he would run too fast, everyone's like, slow down, slow down, yeah. slow down. And they're having this whole conversation in the car, and He's saying, you know, I thought we were special, mom. And mom goes, everyone's special, honey. And he goes, which means no one is. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that is a very unwoke movie, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Go ahead and show it to your kids. The yeah. original one. Yeah. 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 All right, Nick, let's talk about tolerance. Tolerance. This is one of my favorites. Um, I, I will say I've noticed something recently uh, on um, the left. I, I actually saw this. Uh, I can't remember what platform it was. But somebody said, you know, you don't want me to tolerate. You want me to celebrate. And they came back and said, yeah, yeah that's right. We don't want you to just tolerate this. We, we want you to recognize that it is like, whoa, okay, that's different. So, again, if, if we're just looking at basic definitions, um, you know, the ability or willingness to tolerate something in particular, the existence of opinions or behaviors that one does not necessarily agree with. And, you know, I, I, like, I like that definition. I think it's a, a fairly good one. Um, the the what I find interesting in the Merriam-Webster it says sympathy or indulgence for beliefs or practice differing from or conflicting with one's own. I, I think that's a little bit more problematic. I'd like to go in and find out when these definitions changed. Oh, you can like, you can do when, that. Can you see when it was edited and corrected? Because they the definitions do continue to change. They they do, and and you know again this this is a question that we'll we'll probably get into later. But like for tolerance. What I find interesting is, and, and I actually tweeted about this, um, it's this idea that the government has to endorse something or ban something. Right. It can't just be like, this is not a, this is not a realm for government. And, and I got into this issue with somebody, and it was the whole question of gay marriage. 
And they're like, you want to discriminate against me because of, of gay marriage. I said, I don't think the government should define marriage. Like, well, so, so then gay marriage should be allowed. I'm like, what do you mean allowed? Like, I don't think the government should step in and prevent you from, from living your life the way you want, provided you're not infringing on the rights of someone else. By the same token, right? If you try to get married in, in a homosexual relationship within a mosque, they're probably going to say no. Sure. Do I think the government should legally be able to come in and require them to do? No, I don't. It, it, like, it's this whole idea. And they're like, well, you're discriminating against me. I'm like, no more than you're discriminating against me. They're like, no, I have no problem with your heterosexual marriages. No, but you have a problem with a definition of marriage that you don't agree with. You want that definition to, you discriminate against that definition of marriage. Now, provided you don't try to use the law or force or coercion to get me to agree with your definition, I'm, I'm perfectly fine to say, you can live your life based off of your definition of marriage. I can live my life based off of my definition of marriage. And neither one of us have to coerce, threaten, or require the other to endorse it. But that's not good enough for you. No. Okay, so who's the one displaying intolerance at that point? If, if the goal of your tolerance is you have to get other people to endorse what you're doing, well, are, are okay, are you now showing any sort of sympathy or indulgence for a belief that's not your own? It's true. I mean, well, you also look at coexistence because tolerance and coexistence really go hand yeah. in hand. Are, is that one on the list? No. Ooh, good. Well, okay. I got one in here. Well, here's the thing is, it's interesting because so many, they, you know, they've got all these religious symbols. And most of those re religious symbols represent religions that do not have the capacity to coexist with one another in, in a sense of... of um, blending and and yeah. being on the same page they're not on the same page they they're not and to tell them that they all must believe the same thing cuz that's what they're wanting with the coexistence they want everyone to basically believe the same same stuff because they're unwilling to coexist with certain tenets of certain religions yeah so they want those religions to slough off what they disagree with um, in order to coexist. To toler I mean, the, the traditional understanding of tolerance from a legal perspective was like the, the law is essentially like neutral on a particular position. It's neither endorsing nor is it subsidizing nor is it punishing nor is it banning. It, it's many times it'd be silent on the issue. Um, it, but more and more it's become, the, and, and then from a civil standpoint, right? So there's like the legal component, like what does the law say about something? And then there's like the civil society component, which is to say that, hey, I might not agree with you on this, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be rude to you about it. I'm not going to ostracize you about it. And then there's, you know, the other level where it's like, look, I, if I really don't agree with what you're doing, I really don't agree with your interpretation. Um, we might choose not to associate. Or we might choose not to work together on certain things. And tolerance, that, that, there, there was an element which just said, look, I have freedom of association. If you're going to tell me that I, I have to um, celebrate what you're celebrating, well, then I'm, you're no longer demonstrating tolerance, right? You, you've just replaced one intolerance with a different intolerance. Well, and there is some to tolerance is not always a good thing. And that's the other thing, too, is that as you've you've said this so many times that people will attribute virtue to certain words where the words don't have virtue on right. their own. They're yeah. only virtuous in a context. Sure. And so, you know, are you going to be tolerant of a, of a serial killer being among your friends group? Yeah. Yeah. No, if, probably what if, not. What if serial killing is just a part of his core identity and self-actualization, right? It's like, well, no, we wouldn't, we would not, we would not show tolerance toward sexual abuse. Right. right? Well, and we I mean, well, we shouldn't. They'd like uh, us to. Yeah. We shouldn't show tolerance. Toward, so and again, and, and yeah, the way I, I actually had a, um, cause I had another reporter call me up and it was about a, a bill and, and she used our next word. So I might as well go into it. Discrimination. Sure. And she said, well, um, she, the, the, I forget what the bill was about. Um, I think it was, oh, I, at the height of the time when, and, and when everybody was talking about one in four women will be like raped or sexually assaulted on a college campus, I said, okay, great. I'm going to carry a bill that says if you're a woman on campus, you can conceal carry on state universities. They, we can't prevent you from, from concealed carrying. And 
people kind of lost their minds over this. Well, even some of the gun organizations did because they yeah. don't like any carve outs or cutouts. Well, and, and the point was, is that I, look, it, this particular bill, you know, was probably not going to make it out of courts committee because the, there were, so I, I understood what the issues were, but I was trying to make a point that you don't get to tell me these people are living in like mortal danger where 25% of the population is going to be a victim of sexual assault. And then tell me they don't get to defend themselves when they go on this state university campus. And she came back. She goes, well, aren't you discriminating? I said, I said, okay, can we be honest about something real quick? Every single thing you do is an act of discrimination. All right. The, the fact that you chose to listen to this podcast as opposed to cooking spaghetti right now, right. And doing something that do you, both. you discriminated, right? So that's, well, that's one, that's a benign version of discrimination, right? It's the idea of having discernment between things. I said, what we're trying to stop is bigoted discrimination. I said, yes, we don't want bigoted discrimination. We don't want someone to, you know, be be obstinate and and irrational and unreasonable with respect to their hatred towards something. Like, or, you know, we don't want that. That's bigoted discrimination. Yeah, obviously we want to, we don't want that. Um, but this idea that, well, when when I don't get what I want or when you don't approve of what I do, you're engaging in discrimination. And I always look back and be like, yes, no more than you are. And and that, that like they can't wrap their mind right. around it. It's like, no, the fact that I don't agree with you on a particular choice, right, it is not the same as me being bigoted or intolerant of you. I'm not trying to physically prevent you from doing it. I'm not trying to legally prevent you from doing it. I, I am saying that I don't necessarily want to be legally required to recognize that in the same way that you do. But guess what? I'm not requiring you to legally recognize what I like or I prefer. So... This whole thing with discrimination is, it, again, it becomes this idea of if I don't get what I want, you're discriminating against me. Well, again, almost, by that definition, almost inherently, they've also discriminated against you in the same conversation. Sure. And so it, it's important for us to, to isolate the difference between benign discrimination, which is, again, no more than like discernment between two things. Um, and bigoted discrimination, which is to say that I am going to, I'm going to proactively work to either prevent you from having opportunities or, um, I'm going to work within the legal code to try to like, you know, oppress you in some way. Yes, that is a bigoted, immoral form of discrimination, but let, let's make a distinction before we just act like, you know, that like there's, there's, there's no room for discernment within society. Well, Nick, we're big believers in freedom, yeah. but it seems like the left has also tried to hijack that term. Yeah. What do you think about that? Freedom from want. Well, and, and, well, and again, that's the, this is the part where it gets interesting. You know, again, you look at the technical definition of freedom. It's just the state of being free. Okay, right. well, what does that typically mean within political society? Well, generally, it's been associated with the concepts of things like individual liberty. It's, once again, it the way we've always talked about freedom within the American perspective, and again, this has not always been lived out perfectly, obviously, right? But it's this idea that you are free from government oppression. You, you are free from the government and from people using legal codes to infringe on in, you know, inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Again, the, the way we always talk about it kind of here when we use the term liberty, mm -hmm. it's this idea that you, you're free to do what you want with yourself, with your property, provided that you're not infringing in the rights and liberties of other people to do the same. Sure. And, and as long as you don't cross those boundaries, we're cool, right? You can do things that I don't agree with. I can do things that you might not agree with. As long as, you know, we're, we're respecting that boundary, we're, we're okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now, I, and I see this a lot, and, and FDR really popularized this with his four freedoms where he started adding things like freedom from want, so now freedom is no longer freedom from some sort of oppression or, or government interference in your life or third parties intervening in, in your life and decision. Freedom now is freedom from reality. It is. And, and I see yeah. this all the time when, when well, I'll freedom say... Freedom from word definitions. How about that? <laughs> well, you, you see this a lot too when you talk about socialism. And they're like, well, you, you're not... You know, and you point out that, well, socialism is you know, the, the abolition of the private ownership and the means of production, the only way that you can achieve that based off of our current system is for the government to come in and actively, you know, take things away and give them to other people and then set up structure. Like that's typically the only way you're going to be able to achieve that unless you can just convince everybody, uh, which has never happened. 
And so the, the point is, um, and, and then I'll come back and I'll say, well, in capitalism, you're free to do what you want. And with your property, you just can't afford, like, you're not free. If you don't work, you, you can't afford food. That's not a result of capitalism. That's right. a result of reality. Well, they, they're wage slaves, honey. They call themselves <laughs> wage slaves. Well, it, Which, the, again, we should have slavery as one of the words here since they well, have yeah. forgotten what the term meant since well, but they... Th this is especially frustrating to me, though, is because when, when you assign to a system or something else, like, I don't have what I want, so somebody else needs to be responsible for giving it to me, and if they don't, then I'm not free. Well, if the only way you can achieve your newfound definition of freedom is by infringing on the freedom of somebody else, That's right. then it's no longer a universal principle, which can be equally applied, right? You're going to run into some equality and equity yeah. issues there because now you've decided that, well, no, on these categories, I'm entitled to them just by existing. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. Sure. Yeah, if, you're, you're, if not. your freedom depends on the skill set of another person being forced to do something for you, that's that's not a right. You you can't. Oh, well, I guess we're gonna get to rights, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. yeah. No. It's but it, but again, that's not that's not freedom. In fact, the, the sort of freedom that you're pushing for in that moment actually destroys itself. It, it's contradictory because out of necessity, you will have decided. You no, know, we as a particular group have decided what things we must be provided, regardless of our ability to be able to exchange for it. And then you always ask them the question: Okay, well, Who's how's it going to be? It? How's it how's it going to be provided? Right. Well, moving on, thanks to Matt Walsh and the Daily Wire, we all know that the left is no longer aware of what a woman is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so our next term is man and woman. Nick, why do you think that the left has gone on this, what I would call, crazy path of trying to redefine what woman, the word woman, means? I, it's it, a war on women. They're trying to erase actual women. It's, it's uh, gender appropriation. <laughs> you know what? What it is is they have reduced gender... Um, to costumes. It's just costumes. So now if you just, if you like to paint your nails and you like to wear makeup and long hair and you want to wear a dress and, and that type of thing, you're a woman, you know, I'm sorry, but those clothes and those things you put on your exterior body do not equal woman. That is not what a woman is. There is a lot to being a woman. And I actually feel there's not a whole lot that offends me. But I feel offended when people try to chalk up being a woman to a costume. It is definitely gender appropriation. I mean, you remember years back when they were saying, don't dress your kids up as Indians for Halloween. Don't dress your kids up for as if they're from another culture for, you know, for these events and things like that, because that is cultural appropriation. There is zero difference, zero mm -hmm. difference. That is exactly what they're doing. It's it's gender appropriation. You can wear whatever you want to wear. It does not make you a adult fe female sure. human being. Yeah. So, and, and that I mean that is the that is the definition, right? It's an adult but female. But we're person. going to be called bigots for this. Uh, the more we stick to this, and I, I just I can see the culture war sort of starting on this one. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what's well, been going, but this one. There is a massive sticking point because there are so many cutouts and carve outs for women that are now being taken over by men identifying as women that, you know, and, and it's funny because they will say, oh, this is female sports, female sports. But these males who identify as a woman are doing this. And, and becoming a part of this and, and dominating. And one of one of the hairs they try to split is, oh, well. There's, it's the difference between sex and gender. Sex and gender, they're, they're different. It's not the same thing, and you're conflating the two. No, they are conflating the two because these things are for female human beings, and these men who think they're women are, are now appropriating it, and they are acting like there is no difference between female and male now. I mean, if you identify as a woman, now you get to be in female sports. So this whole sex versus gender split is it's just a pretend thing. It's just to try to get the line moved a little bit. But what they really mean is 100 percent. Well, I, I think there, there's a deeper uh, there really is a deeper philosophical issue going on with with this. And, and it's kind of core. It, <laughs> this sounds so I don't know crazy. It, it's kind of core to existence. Um, 
because if you there, there's a couple different ways to you know look at yourself with respect to you know who you are, what is reality. It's called the study of epistemology. How do you know what you know? Things like that. And what's what's interesting is that a lot of this a, a lot of this sort of definitions comes from an element which is somewhat nihilistic, in the sense that what they mean is. You know, there, there really is no objective truth, which is a self-defeating statement. We've gone yeah. over this before, right? Whenever somebody says there's no objective truth, ask them if that statement's objectively true. But I, I think what it is is that, like, so for me, if you were to ask me what's what's the single most core element of my identity, I would be like, it's my Christian faith. Right? Because that that's the starting point, like created in the image of God. Like, and and so that's that's core and fundamental to my identity. I don't demand that you share that. I don't sure. demand that you endorse that. I don't demand that you celebrate it. But that is core to my identity. If you replace that and you're, and you're looking for something else, what I find interesting is that, and, and this is predominantly a left wing narrative. I don't, I don't, you know, know of any you know conservatives that are really pushing it. Um, if you believe that the the fundamental nature of your identity, the the most important component is your your sex or gender identification. Um, and, and that's a combination of things, right? Because we're we're not talking about we're not talking about immutable characteristics in the sense that, you know, you're biologically male or biologically female, or you're biologically a particular ethnicity. We're not we're not talking about that. We're, we're now going into a realm where th there isn't something objective that we can really pinpoint, other than I identify as this, and because I identify as this, and because that's core to my identity, the moment you do not accept, celebrate, um, or go along with it. You're now denying my existence. Like, no, I'm I'm not denying your existence. I'm I'm denying a claim that you're making, a truth claim that you're making about what defines male and female. And, and this whole idea that well, one's gender and it's just a pure social construct, and the other is biological sex, and that's the distinction. <laughs> the gender distinctions were made based off of distinctions within biological sex. Right, it, it was never. It was never a boy plays with dolls. Therefore, he's a girl. It was a boy plays with dolls. He likes dolls. That's a that's something that we generally associate with, um, you know, feminine traits. But we were never confused that that automatically yeah. somehow changed the 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 hardcore biological makeup of of you know what this little boy was. And so I, I think we're we're moving more and more into this realm, and and you really see it specifically. I asked the question once. I said, "What can you?" What is something that I could identify as that the left would be like, no, 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 that's unacceptable. What is it? Is it race? It might be race. They might not be willing to accept that. But then you, you well, have. I mean, they did. Look at Rachel Dozell, who yeah. headed up the NAACP for however long, who well, but was then, white. But then you've got to ask that. You've got to ask that core. Well, the NAACP, I think, was a chapter in like Washington. But it, but here's the question. Why is it that sex is the one that is like absolutely sacred? That's the sacrament. If, if this is, you know, you're not even allowed to call it a preference anymore, right? Because it's a core part of their identity. Well, what if they're fluid? Then it's, is it a core part of their identity? Is it a core part of identity that they're fluid? Like, what, what is it? And it's gone to this whole idea of like, well, it's whatever they say it is. Okay, well, then I say this. Well, no, 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 that's not acceptable. Who says? Right? You, you, keep, you keep sneaking in with this objective standard by what is okay to identify as, and then what I'm obligated to do based off of what somebody else decides about reality. But if I try to do the same thing, you've decided where the boundaries are. And, and what you're seeing now is, no, I, the boundaries were just fine when we could all look at ob objective scientific reasoning. We could look at all and say, like, look, no, it's, it's very clear that there's certain biological distinctions between male and female. And so we're, we're going to respect those categories. But if you're now telling me that it's arbitrary it, it's based off of a deep psychological conviction I have, regardless of how that psychological conviction plays out in reality or whether or not it corresponds to reality. And, and let's, let's get something really straight here. For, for most of history, the whole concept of, of psychiatry, psychology was, was rooted around this idea, especially when you were counseling someone, was when somebody was dealing with an issue that obviously contradicted reality, the whole purpose was to get to their thinking in line with reality, not insist that reality was perfectly malleable based off of whatever their preference happened to be. Mm -hmm. Now and people are driving, driving you further into your delusion. Yeah. That's, that's kind of one of the issues. One of the reasons this one is so pernicious. I mean, even if you look at Matt Walsh's video, which I, 
I really think everybody should watch that. Um, it, it was, it was incredible. Good. Yeah. And there was a portion where he was talking to a doctor who performs uh, gender affirming surgeries on minors. Yeah. And he asked that doctor, well, what if there is someone who identifies as an amputee and they would just really like to have a limb take and removed because they feel that they are an amputee, you know, and this doctor looks at him and goes, well, that sounds kooky. <laughs> and we're like, oh, but you go ahead and chop off or mutilate someone's body uh, based on on something else. I, I won't say all of what goes through my mind. I can't. But uh, it is really, really shocking to me that they cannot see the correlation. Absolutely cannot see the correlation between that. And uh, we've definitely gotten to a point where uh, society has overwhelmingly accepted this, at least in the West, at least in Western culture. Uh, it is, it is very, very socially acceptable now. And, and I love the fact that Matt Walsh went to Africa to talk to a prominent African tribe there to run these ideas past them. And they just basic, they basically like laughed at it, um, and couldn't believe it. They would prefer not to come to the U S over it, mm. but it is a very distinctly Western idea to um, to m merge the genders and and have all this fluidity and 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 things like that. Um, we were talking just beforehand about uh, even the word straight um, is no longer straight. It is now super straight. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you are straight heterosexual, you're super heterosexual. And that and what that means is if you don't want to be with someone who has basically the same equipment you have, uh, you are now transphobic and yeah. super straight. Yeah. So but, but again, I, I think this this one, this one is actually far more fundamental than I think people mm -hmm. think it is, because most people look at this and be like, well, look, just if they want to do that, what's the big deal? I'm like if, if they want to do that. I'm again, I am not going to come in and try to legally prevent them from doing it. I'm not going to try to like, you know, punish, but I also don't have to agree with that because the moment you require me to say, no, 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 this is fine. And this is true. The moment you require, now you're making me a party to something that not only do I not think is true, but I think ultimately is harmful for that person and harmful for society in general. When you have 12 year old girls getting double mastectomies, and ending because, up with osteoporosis. Yeah, because some somebody said, "Oh, well, it's it, you know, gosh, these these puberty blockers are are totally, you know." Oh, they're fine. Yeah, safe, they, they won't work. They're safe. We're reversible. Like, yeah. oh, really? Oh, you know this? You know this for a fact? Because we have we just have mountains of studies that have been done over time with people that have done this. And it, oh no, we don't have that. Like, I, I'm just so amazed. Well, no, I mean, we do have chemical castration, which is yeah. the same thing. All right, we've got a couple more terms here. We're going to do a bit of a speed round with the next five, and then I have a series of questions that I'm going to propose to Nick that I think are going to help us make the argument when we get into conversations, and those who are not in line with us use them. All right, first one, justice. <laughs> well, again, you know, justice used to be a just result. Kind of a, like a simple way to think about this is most people think of justice as like the, the morally correct thing happens to the right person at the right time at the right place for the right reasons, et cetera. Right. right. So like somebody is accused of a crime, they're not guilty. We go through a process and they're determined not to be guilty and they genuinely are not right. We would say like that was a just outcome. Sure. Right. It, it's so it's, it's the proper moral outcome that best reflects reality is generally what we associate with justice. Well, now, and now when, when that was the term, we all kind of understood it. Yeah. We might disagree on the best way to achieve a just outcome, but we all generally appreciate it. Yeah, that's, that's what justice is. Well, now it's social justice, environmental justice, economic yeah. justice, um, you know, food justice, right? And everything that, once again, presents itself in a disparity, um, all of a sudden that is evidence of injustice, I'm like, well, wait a second. No, not every disparity is evidence of injustice. But why would you why would you redefine it that way? Well, if you're the sort of person that, if you're the sort of person that believes that what we really need is more government power, control, and intervention, well, that's the one entity that can actually go in there and force things to be equal. Yeah, that's the one entity that can go in there and take from you and give to you. And and so 
obviously, if, if your definition of justice has to do with getting rid of these, any sort of disparities, which you think are, are you know, again, bad, um, well, then, uh, of course, that's the mechanism you're going to use. And, of course, you're going to associate that with justice. The, the problem is, is that, once again, even if you have the best intentions, you're relying on a very imperfect apparatus to right. use a whole lot of force and violence in order to achieve what you want. And last time I checked... There's been a couple of governments within history, world history, that have tried to achieve social justice, and they did it by butchering and murdering millions of people. Now, you might look at that and be like, well, that's ridiculous. I don't, I don't care that you don't associate yourself with that. I mean, I do in the sense that I'm glad you don't think that's a good thing, but the fact that you haven't learned anything from that lesson, that maybe this major powerful government apparatus that you're relying upon to achieve justice because you like the fact that they can force people to do what you think is the just outcome, you, you don't you don't see that potentially going bad somewhere. And so again, this this redefinition of justice is we find a disparity within society, and in order to eliminate that disparity, we need to use force. And so the government's going to and if you don't agree with that, you oppose justice. Mm. Once again, I don't oppose justice. I certainly oppose your redefining what a just outcome is and then insisting upon a solution, which I believe is far more likely to backfire and create injustices than solve the problems that we both agree are problems. Uh -huh. All right, next one. Right. Yeah. I this think is... this one's probably the most pervasive yeah. out of all of them. Oh, yeah. Well, and you hear this all the time. We saw this with the gun one. You know, I've had examples of this. Everybody has this like, well, I, I have a right to feel safe. No, you don't. You don't. You can't possibly have a right to feel safe in the sense that it's somebody else's obligation to make, make you. you feel safe. Right. And, and this is this is, again, when we go back to the whole concept of negative rights versus positive rights, a negative right is saying that like so when we talk about inalienable rights like life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The reason why you can have an inherent or an inalienable right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness is because nobody should be able to come in and murder you. Nobody should be able to, you know, come in and prevent you from, again, living your life the way you want, providing you're not infringing on the right of somebody else. But those three things, life, liberty, and the person, nothing requires anybody else to do anything. Sure. Well, yeah. In, in, order, in order to give you that, right. right? Or in order for you to have that. You just inherently have it. You, um, you can see it just in the wording used. You're not, you're not entitled to life, liberty, and happiness. It's the pursuit, pursuit of happiness. You're right. you're entitled yeah. to the pursuit of that happiness. Yeah. Happiness may or may not come as a result. Yeah. Well, because and, and again, this is one of those things where you have to look at what are the implications of your version of positive rights. Positive rights is when now you are owed something, right? You have a right to something. Sure. And that always comes with some sort of obligation on behalf of somebody else. And the problem with pushing this concept of positive rights is that if you have a right to food, if you have a right to shelter, if you have some constitution, you have a right to marriage, right? Okay, well, when I don't get married, have I been denied my rights? Well, well, no, I, we, we don't mean it that way, but that's what you said. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, like, I understand if you're trying to say, hey, we want to protect your ability to go out and find someone and, and get married. We want to protect your ability to go out and, you know, live in the sort of house you want. I, get, I understand all of that. The moment you say you have a right to the thing, to the physical object. Anytime you don't have the thing, you've now been denied your rights. That's not an appropriate way to look at it. Well. It's not an appropriate way to look out at something because eventually if you, if you go down that line of reasoning, what you're saying is I want to empower some other entity to give me things, right, at the expense of their rights. Sure. So if the only way, again, like freedom, if the only way you can, if the only way you can experience your rights is by infringing on somebody else's, there's something inherently wrong with that definition. And that's the big problem between positive rights and negative rights. Positive rights, generally speaking, garbage. Negative rights are, are the ones that are actually like logically sustainable. All right. This one has come up in the last two years for sure, but I'm going to wrap them together. Science mm -hmm. and experts. Okay, so this is fun, especially with science, because it wasn't that long ago that the Smithsonian and one of their museums actually had a thing that said, I think it was like characteristics of whiteness. And they listed the scientific method as one of those. Because when we talk about science, we're generally talking about a, a field of knowledge which looks at the physical universe and uses certain processes in order to arrive at reasonable and logical conclusions, right? That's sure. generally what we mean when we talk. And that's what the scientific method helps you do. Um, but it's, it's funny because the same left that is like science, 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 follow the science, follow the science. Okay, but 
then you put something on me say that, you know, and, and over dependency or an emphasis on the scientific method or linear thinking or all of these other or, or critical thinking that these are attributes of whiteness, which I believe is a horribly racist thing to say. Very. Um, so when people say follow the science, I'm like, okay, if you mean follow a particular method of inquiry in order to make, again, reasonable observations about the physical universe, I got no problem with that. Yeah. But the moment science becomes a person or a particular expert or an authority or an authority, that's problematic. And the same people that are screaming, follow the money when it comes to anything within the private sector, all of a sudden believe that if a government expert says something and you happen to agree with the political party they affiliate with, that's the final word. And, and part of the problem with this, and I, again, another reporter, you know, shouldn't we follow the science? I'm like, what do you mean by that? They well, certainly don't do it, yeah. at least not with gender. Yeah. So I, I think this is the problem. When, when science is an objective set of criteria that we can use to analyze facts and do data analysis, we got no problems. The moment science is a person or an institution or a government body, that's problematic. The other problem with this whole experts argument is I can appreciate the expertise someone might have in a, in a situation. And that expertise might come from some sort of credential or some sort of field experience or learned experience through life lessons, et cetera. I can choose to appreciate that expertise or I can choose not to appreciate it. Because, and what, what expertise is supposed to give you is a higher degree of probability that you will be correct in the analysis that you conduct and the conclusion that you come to. But the moment you say, well, the expert said this, therefore it is, that's what we call an appeal to authority fallacy. And one of the big things I tell people to do is whenever they're like, oh, follow the experts or follow the science, I'm like, okay, if, if, you're, if you're pointing me in the direction, if you're saying, I think this person's analysis is good, that's one thing. The moment you're telling me, well, all the experts say this, you're now giving me an appeal to authority right. fallacy. And all the experts don't agree. In, yeah. And in, in the current uh, environment that we have, Experts who disagree are completely blacklisted. Oh, when they're banned from social yeah. media? I mean, that's the part where we're starting to see Not more and more Not just banned from social media, but a lot of them end up getting fired from universities yeah. and banned from uh, speaking engagements. Well, this is the other important thing, too, when people are always talking about, like, we need more money for education. We need more money for science. What they generally mean is we need more government funding for these things. And one of the things I try to point out is you're now, once again, you're creating perverse incentives. You're creating an incentive structure within the university or within the school system to prop up whatever element of government or whatever philosophy within government is giving them money. So yeah, follow the money, but please do it within government as well because it is going to manipulate the so-called expertise that you're relying upon to make decisions when that expert who may be really smart or may just have the right credential from the right university that's pushing a particular ideology if you're now basing life decisions off of that, or even worse, you're basing coercive government policy, which will tell people do this or else without any sort of inquiry in, into the actual data they're looking at, that's ridiculous. Yeah. We spent an ent multiple episodes on this topic. Yeah. And so let's keep the short neck, okay. please. <laughs> uh, democracy. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so democratic processes are certainly good for a number of things. Democratic processes are good for electing representatives. Democratic processes can be good for elected representatives then debating and deciding how they want to vote on a particular issue. Um, we don't live in a democracy in the sense that the, the majority of the people just get what they want as long as they got the votes. We don't live in a representative democracy in that sense. We don't live in a pure democracy in that sense. We live in a constitutional republic. And what that does is it puts a lot more emphasis on certain restrictions on government power. Now, we still use and should use democratic processes. But the biggest problem I have with this is democracy is more and more becoming synonymous with freedom. Oh, that's a threat to our democracy. Well, when you get people thinking that freedom is nothing more than getting to elect your representatives, politicians love that because essentially you're saying that as long as, as, long as I got to vote for you, whatever power you have, it is, is morally justifiable. No, genuine freedom is actually living in a state where you have very little um, you, you know, intervention from outside forces telling you what to do through, through politics or through the government. Um, so this idea that democracy is synonymous with freedom or democracy is, is an accurate representation of what we have in the United States is wrong. Right? Certain democratic processes are good for certain decisions. But nobody here wants to live in a world where your neighbor gets to vote on where you have dinner tonight. You want to be able to make the individual choice for you based off of your preferences and what's available within the marketplace. You don't want to vote on it with everybody. What a stupid way to run things. 
So stop using democracy as, as if it's the, the final arbiter of what is good or moral or right. just or efficient. Yeah. Because there's been a lot of things that democratic societies that have done have been unjust and immoral and horrible. So I just I, I hate how that term gets conflated. Last one is racism. <laughs> well, that's a racist way to ask that question, Hamilton. Well, ra racism used to be really understood as the, the belief in the superiority or inferiority of another individual based off of their racial or ethnic um, makeup. That, that used to be the definition, and it's a definition that makes absolute sense and works. Um, it, it's since been expanded, and, and they're trying to include things like, you know, systemic oppression and things like that, where it's like, yes, a, a racist society can produce elements of systemic oppression, um, but more and more the, the scary part is when people try to suggest that, well, no, 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 racism is associated with power. So if you have social, economic, or political power, you therefore have the ability to be a racist. If you do not possess social, economic, and political power, you can't be a mm -hmm. racist. That's absurd, and I can usually prove it in one example. Let's take the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, right? Total punk. Democrat. If you, if you, were, to, if you were to pick him up and take him over to a, a country where... You know, he had, he had never been there before, brand new, and he's the minority. He's a minority, and he possesses no economic, social, or political power within that environment. Would he cease being a racist? And everyone like, well, no, he's still a racist. He, exactly. Racism is a state of mind with respect to another individual based off of their race. That's what racism is. Anybody is capable of being racist. Now, on the larger conversation on where, where do we spend our time and resources combating racism? Yes, I am much more concerned about a racist politician or a racist like CEO or a racist police chief. I'm far more concerned about them because they have the means to carry out their racism in, in a way that can have huge impacts. I'm more concerned about them than I am some dude sitting in their mom's basement, you know, writing little tracks that three people see on a 4chan channel, Right. So obviously we can make the distinction that the threat of racism from people in power is far greater than the threat of racism from someone that possesses no power. But to suggest that they are somehow incapable of being racist if they don't have a sufficient level of power is absurd mm -hmm. and actually does a disservice to the combating of racism. I think also uh, we have also conflated racism with certain types of uh, stereotype um, like insensitivities. Yeah, there there are little colloquialisms and, and little things that people have always just sort of said or done or, or what that now are under a microscope going, you're a racist because you said this. And it's like, well, I didn't know that was a racist thing. Well, and what's what's interesting, too, is that there's certain things that are kind of there, there's certain things that are kind of cultural. So, like, I'll give you a perfect example. There, there's a there's a joke in baseball when it's a like a kid from uh, the Caribbean. Why? Because the Caribbean has produced like just like a disproportionate number of really good baseball yeah. players. Um, and so that that is a that could be considered like an ethnic stereotype. Now, you could argue that, well, it's not a negative one. Um, but the, the question is, is why does that stereotype exist? Well, because there's been a disproportionate number of people from that particular area or region that have been really, really good at baseball. Um and, and, you know, and Thomas Sowell brings this off, too, when he's talking about most of the brewmasters across the world are German. Same thing with piano makers. Yeah. A lot of the, the Swiss or a lot of the watchmakers were like Huguenots or Swiss. So it, it's interesting that certain stereotypes can develop over time. Um, and, and again, the question is, 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 that a, is that a racist stereotype in the sense that you're trying to, you know, pejoratively classify an entire group of people based off of this? Um, th that's obviously wrong, right? But it, it, it's just, it's amazing now that, um, and, and I do think people should be careful in the sort of like observations and the generalities that they try to make. Mm -hmm. um, but, but somebody now can make a statement that might've been considered like complimentary or, or innocent that now it's like, oh, well, you're a racist. Well, no, I don't believe in the superiority or inferiority of that. I'm making an observation that this group of people seems to be disproportionately good at this. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That, that, that doesn't mean that everybody within that group is disproportionately good at this. Um, 
but it, and, and again, some of that also, this is also where we get into the breaking the, the distinctions between race and culture. Mm -hmm. and, and I got in trouble in a college class once for this. And when I explained myself, the students actually kind of backed me up. It was kind of great. Um, but the, the guy kept using a particular ethnicity and, and saying, you know, this culture, this culture, this culture. I said, wait a second, what do you mean by that? And, and he looked at me like just stunned that I would question that you could define a cult. You couldn't define a culture by a particular race. And I said, I'm willing to bet that if I ask someone of that race from Los Angeles versus Moscow versus, you know, uh, Pretoria, South Africa versus Paris, France, if I ask them all that same question, you know, the probability they give me the exact same answer because their skin color happens to be the same. I, I don't know that that's accurate. No, the idea of it is inherently racist. Well, it, 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 I would say at the very least, it's kind of like racially insensitive, this idea right. that because you share this characteristic, therefore you must think the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the counter to that is there are a lot of people that shared a particular char characteristic that were treated the same way. So you, you can talk about, um, you know, black people who are in slavery. Right. You can talk about um, like the Jews during the Holocaust. They were treated a certain way based off of a racial characteristic. And so they formulated certain cultural responses based off of that experience. And, and I think it's very important to make that distinction. Um, but all this to say that, unfortunately, we've gotten to the point where we can't even have productive. I always hear that we, we need to have a conversation about a lot of the people that are yelling they about wanting to have, have a, have conversation, a conversation. Do not want a conversation. Right. They don't even want to ask questions. They want you to sit there, shut up, and, and do what you're told, and, and regurgitate the you know EBRMX Kindy approved responses. Mm -hmm. The minute you try to have a conversation, I mean, you've seen this. Uh, there was recently a conversation with a professor, and I think it was like a senator or something, or maybe it was a congressman, who was questioning the whole gender thing. Yeah. And this was a women's studies professor. Yeah. And so, of course, she should know what the definition of a woman yeah. is. And uh, she refused to go on. I, I I need to make you make the, the congressman or senator aware that this line of questioning is transphobic. Uh, yeah. I did see that. So yeah, you, you that. get to this, oh, your line of questioning is this buzzword oh. that we don't like. Oh, so therefore, you can no longer speak. Your voice is gone. Well, we got to do it. We got to do one bonus word here. Violence. Ah. Uh. Oh, yeah. Because, again, violence has always been the, the, the term that we think of it of is, is usually associated with physical violence. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a couple different ways we look at this. If I, if I come up and aggressively hit you, right, I'm, in, I'm engaging in what would be considered an inappropriate level or an inappropriate act of violence because it was, it was aggressive. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you also hit me back to defend yourself, you're also engaging in violence. But the violence you're engaging in is self-defense. So we make a moral distinction between aggressive violence and, and we generally associate it with some sort of physical um, act. Now, we have other versions that are like assault. You can verbally assault somebody. Yeah. Right? You, you can verbally abuse someone. You can incite someone to violence by encouraging them, directly encouraging them to engage in violent activity. But this idea that the moment you say something I don't like or don't agree with, you're now engaging in violence What's so dangerous about that is that what you're saying is if you have an opinion that the powers that be don't like, they now get to use violence against you right. because it's self-defense. See, they, they understand the value of violence right? and they want to be able to use it and they can't use it if you're having a discussion. Yeah. But the moment they can classify your language as violence, it's oh, because wow. now I get to use violence against you. And that is a very dangerous concept. That is. It's a huge manipulation. Yeah. Well, Tina, I'm glad you brought up the Senate hearing because I here, here's one of my first questions, and I think all of, hopefully these questions are going to help us better make the argument. Uh, Nick, what would you say to someone with responded with, you're denying that trans men exist? I, this is, again, it's one of those arguments that I can't stand. Um, if, if by a trans man you mean a woman who identifies as a man. I'm not denying their existence because I don't agree with their conclusion about reality. All right. But the reason why they sort of like you're denying their existence is because once again, they've decided that your sexual identity or preference is paramount to who you are. And if I say, well, I, I don't acknowledge that you saying that you're a man when you don't possess the biological characteristics of one, 
I'm, I'm not going to acknowledge that. Well, then you're, you're questioning my existence. And, and what is that? Well, now you're engaging in violence, uh. right? Because now I'm, I'm denying your very existence. And if I'm denying your very existence, then I'm putting myself or others in the capacity to commit acts of violence against you because you're not a real person. Well, no, that's not what we're doing at all. I disagree with your conclusion about reality. I don't disagree with the fact that you're a person. I don't disagree with the fact that you have value. I don't disagree with the fact um, that, that you, know, you, you should be free from someone trying to come in and you know, aggressively hurt you or harm you or whatever it is. But no, I'm not obligated to, mm. it, because if that's true, if that's true, well then theoretically, anything I identify as that you don't acknowledge, now you're committing an act of violence against me. Like there's, once you get into that sort of roundabout way of discussing things, there is no way for us to come to peaceful conclusions yeah. because you've now set something up to where terms mean nothing. And then on, on top of that, or, or they're not objective in the sense that we can both appeal to them and, mm -hmm. and understand what we're talking about. Well, if we don't have a mechanism for a peaceful conversation, if we don't have a mechanism for peacefully leaving each other alone, right? If, if my failure to, you know, recognize your reality the way you want in, entitles you to commit an act of violence against me or coercion against me, well, then you're now creating the preconditions for every issue to be solved based off of might makes right. Well, that brings me, it brings me to my next, next question. What is the big deal with language being fluid and adaptable? Okay, so it depends, right? I, obviously, you know, a, a word, language is, is fluid. It is adaptable mm -hmm. in the sense that new words are created. So, like, for instance, Googling something. Yeah. That, that term didn't exist, you know, 30 years ago. It exists now as kind of like a, a colloquial understanding of this is one of the primary search engines. And so Googling something is, is um, something that we've added to the language to mean something, that, but it has shared meaning. Th that's what gives it value as language is it has shared meaning among the people using the term. Uh, that's why we go to the great lengths to define these terms and understand their origins and understand why you know, they, they've taken on the characteristics and meaning that they have. Once you start fundamentally altering a term to mean something that it either never meant before um, or is not properly included within the definition or even worse, changes the very nature mm -hmm. of the meaning yep. of the word, you're, you're now creating a, a massive problem with respect, a roadblock to effective communication between people. And, and what I find so interesting about that is that there, there's, there's a couple reasons why one might do this, but I think one of the most kind of underhanded reasons is if a word has a certain social value, mm -hmm. like equality, inclusion, um, and, and basically people like either what that term means or they all understand that what that term means is something bad. Hijacking a term and then changing the definition is an attempt to bring along the positive social yep. sentiment while basically propping up an argument that your, your word or that definition doesn't actually prop up or, or doesn't sure. actually support. And so you're, again, it's, it, it's like, I call it hijacking. You're, you're not just redefining the word, you're hijacking it because right. you want the social sentiment attached to it, but now you want to redefine it to mean something it never meant before. So that then when somebody says, wait a second, I don't agree with that. Like, Oh, you're against equality. You're against fairness. Yeah. You're against tech. No, I'm, I'm against your application. Well, that's what it means now. Yeah. Well, you know, I was listening to a podcast a couple months ago discussing how, you know, how the left operates on Twitter versus the right. The right is knows that there are those who, from the left on Twitter. We allow them to operate. We have no problem with them operating. They we believe in free speech. They put out whatever they want to. But those on the left, when they see the right putting out statements on what they believe and they disagree with that statement, well, then, oh, this person needs to be blocked or banned or we can't have this on the platform. Um, and, and I think that's a great illustration for the differences between the two sides. But I almost see this uh, hijacking of terms to be the next step in their, um, you know, them trying to force everyone to be their version of tolerant. If they can't convince you to agree with them, well, then they are going to change the definition of the word to make it feel like you were the one who's left behind. Yes. In order to to advance that way of thinking. Like you need to just get well, with the program. There, there's a big difference. There, there's a big difference between trying to push something in a particular direction socially mm -hmm. and trying to use the government to compel people to do things. Yeah. Right. So there, there's multiple levels here. 
the government's the one I have a real heartburn with because now you're you're not saying I'm not going to do business with you. You're saying I'm going to have the government shut down your business if you don't do what I want, or I'm going to have the business I'm going to have the government like fire you or whatever it is. That's problematic because again, it's the th- it's coercion. You know, for all the talk about speech as violence, you know what's violence? Violence, right? <laughs> having having law enforcement, um, you know, threaten you or the government threaten you with with jail time or confiscation of your property. Um, because you didn't conform to what the government wanted you to do on 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 like one of the topics we've been talk- discussing, that's violence, and and it's amazing to me that if I if I utter an opinion you don't like, right, you you can accuse me of engaging in violence, but if you're if you're openly advocating to change the law in such a way that would include government penalties, if I don't do what you want, that's not violence. No, that's democracy. It's outsourced violence, right? It's it's outsourced violence. But but here's um, you know again to to that point, the next level down is that social pressure, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do business with you, or you know we're going to lobby. Uh, look, it, I, sometimes I understand it. Sometimes I think it's overblown. But in in all of those situations, that's still a peaceful mean of of, of social interaction. And so, as much as I might disagree with it at times or not like it at times. I don't, I don't condemn that to the same degree that I can. What I, what I believe is, is that, okay, if you don't like what they're doing, then get off your butt and go shop where they're telling you not to shop, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you don't like what they're doing, don't go to Disneyland. You know, cancel your Disney Plus subscription. Um, do what the Daily Wire is doing or what, like, the Tuttle Twins are doing. Like, create, create another space within the marketplace in order to meet this demand that people obviously have. Because let's face it, Hollywood is not an accurate reflection of American society. Yeah. But they're the ones producing the vast majority of our entertainment. So, all right, great. Create competitive environments where, you know, you, you can do that. And, and look, don't be surprised when the left's going to try to chalk up everything you do to violence because they have a certain outcome. The only way that they can see to achieve that outcome it is through more government control. Yeah. Um, now, now, a hard-blown Marxist will say, well, the end of Marxism is actually no government at all because we'll all be, you know, have our place. Okay, whatever. Um, show, show me one time when you've actually tried to do it that way and it worked. Yeah. So... You know, again, just just understand you're going to be called these things. Do your best to understand the actual definitions of words. Don't engage Mm -hmm. in 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 behavior or activity that is immoral or or unjust or not true. But also, don't be scared to stand up for what you believe to be true, and and to live that out in your life. Mm -hmm. One thing to wrap up here. One thing that I find really interesting is most all of the terms that the left has hijacked all have to do with some sense of community. Equity, equality, tolerance, discrimination, they all uh, describe, you know, have to do with how we interact with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I think this has been a good episode. Well, I want to I want to I want to end on this quote because I think it's a really good one. And you could you could you could take out one of the words and put in another one to be fine. Uh, but it comes from an author. His pen name is Theodore Dalrymple. Oh, yeah. And uh, great book. One of, one of the books I really appreciated was his life at the bottom. Um, and he, he did a lot of work as. Uh, a psychiatrist. He worked with, he worked in Africa. He worked in the um, British uh, prison system. Really interesting experiences. Um, he said, "Political correctness is communist propaganda writ small." In my study of communist societies, I came to the conclusion that the purpose of communist propaganda was not to persuade or convince, not to inform, but to humiliate. And therefore, the less it corresponded to reality, the better. When people are forced to remain silent when they are being told the most obvious lies, or even worse, when they are forced to repeat the lies themselves, they lose once and for all their sense of probity. To assent to obvious lies is in some small way to become evil oneself. One standing to resist anything is thus eroded and even destroyed. A society of emasculated liars is easy to control. I think if you examine political correctness, it has the same effect and is intended to. Wow. Now you could take out political correctness and put in woke terminology or whatever else it is. But if you look at the way people are responding to it, if you look at what they're demanding that you say, demanding that you believe, if they're, if you look at the things that they're demanding that you say, at least publicly, or they'll punish you. And more and more, if you refuse to do it, they'll say that you're perpetuating violence. Just remember when they're accusing you of engaging in violent behavior, when you are not engaging in violent behavior, it, it may very well be out of a desire to be able to commit violence against you. Wow. So anyways, um, 
I want to thank everyone for, for listening, for watching this. Let us know if there's some other terms that you would like to hit. One of the best places you can do that is also the volley chat. Um, I'm sure we'll have enough terms, maybe do another episode on yeah. this at some time in the future. I'd, but I'd love to get everyone's thoughts in volley about some of the terms that we may not have covered that they yeah. have been they've heard as well. Yeah, and, and again, for those of you you know, volley chat, it is super easy to use. It is. You go in there, you, you join our channel, you go on making the argument, you get to do a quick little video asking us your question or tell us about, you know, the, the issue or whatnot. And we get to respond in a video chat. And so you get a, you get a much more direct response to a question without having to like, you know, put something in like hope we can address it in, yeah. in one of our future episodes. We can get, we can get answers to you much quicker. And we, you can also give us your feedback, which there's really a lot appreciate. of back and forth between yeah. us and even the listeners as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So check out the volley check, join that, uh, making the argument community. We look forward to hearing you there. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next episode.